Chapter 13. A Family Thing On the night of May 16, 1936, my mother and father got married. This was three years after Lou Spinelli, nicknamed Poppy, had spotted pretty, dark-haired Lorna Bigler on the dance floor at the Orioles Lodge and said to his friend Babe Richards, See that girl? That's who I'm going to marry. On the night of their wedding, they were on another dance floor at the Little Ritz, a night spot on Route 202 north of town. They were broke, so this was all the honeymoon they would have. At one point during the evening, an announcement was made. A contest would determine the prettiest lady in attendance. My mother doesn't recall the contest procedure, only the result. The winner was the new Mrs. Lou Spinelli. Her prize was a gift certificate to have her portrait done at the Davis Photography Studio. Four and a half years later, on February 1, 1941, I was born. My brother Bill came along four and a half years after that, on July 29, 1945. My mother's wedding day prize, the framed portrait from Davis Studio, stands today on her bedroom dresser, the center of a tiptic flanked by photo portraits of toddlers, Bill and me. And Jerry makes three. Here I am at three months in 1941. Mothers can get short-changed by memory. My recollections, for example, begin somewhere in my third year. By then, some of my best experiences with my mother, some three years' worth of constant daily interaction, were already over. When my mind's recorder finally turned on, it was moments with my father that made the more memorable impressions. Trips to high school ball games, backyard baseball, setting up the Christmas crochet. My mother's attentions continued, of course, but they tended to be less obvious, less noticed. They were the background of my life, the everyday care and support that at last came into full recognition when I acquired a family of my own. The marriage of Luis Anthony Spinelli and Lorna May Bigler brought together two heritages, Italian, my father, and Pennsylvania Dutch, my mother. When I think of my Italian side, I think, of my, I think first of Sundays after church. The four of us would walk, or after 1954 when we got our first car, ride, the floor block, four blocks from First Presbyterian to my grandparents' home at 20, or 226 Chestnut. It was a row house with porches front and back and a rose arbor and dark polished furniture that made the living and dining rooms feel gloomy to me. The kitchen was where, was where the light and the people and the food were. Around the kitchen table sat aunts and uncles and cousins and always at the head my grandfather, Alessandro Alex Spinelli. In front of him was a small glass pitcher of red wine. Before each meal, including a breakfast of cold spaghetti, he drew the wine from his own barrel in the cellar. He was bald and not, did not speak English very well, and his breath always smelled of garlic, and he smoked thin black wicked stogies, and his fingers were as thick as sausages. He had labored many years for the Pennsylvania Department of Highways. Later, the borough of Norristown employed him as a street sweeper. Sometimes, riding my bike, I would see him with other older men, pushing a broom along a curb. That was his job. His love was the farm, a small patch of vacant land that he rented in the East End. During the growing months, every day after work, he went to the farm to tend his vegetables. I like to think that, as he put hoe to earth, he sometimes reflected on what to me was the remarkable central fact of his life. He came over on a boat all by himself when he was only 14 years old. That's how I say it, even now when describing my grandfather's coming to this country. He was an orphan in Italy. He worked in the olive groves around Naples. An aunt arranged for relatives to meet him in New York, handed him a one-way ticket on a steamship, and off he went across the Atlantic Ocean, a black-haired teenager, alone, solo. Fifty years later, I, a nine-year-old American-born boy, sat at his kitchen table, eating the roast chicken with my fingers, because that's how he did it, trying to imagine the bald old man at the head of the table with black hair. The first course was always salad, as simple as salad gets, lettuce with oil and vinegar, then came the chicken, then spaghetti and meatballs. My grandmother often made her own spaghetti, rolling out the dough and slicing it into strands with a device that reminded me of a harp. She would spend a whole day nursing the gravy at the stove. To many Italians, spaghetti sauce is gravy. The dessert was often hot chestnuts roasted on a second stove in the cellar. As with the Spinelli's, a table stands in the center of my memory of the, ma of the maternal relatives. In this case, the table is not in the kitchen, but on the sloping lawn under a huge oak tree. Made of planks laid over sawhorses, the table is very long and is crowded, with pickled eggs and cold cuts and potato salad and three bean salad and lemon meringue pie and dozens of other goodies. 
The place is my Aunt Isabel and Uncle Ted's home in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, about ten miles from Norristown. The occasion is the annual family reunion. In my early years, the reunion was, after Christmas, the biggest event on my calendar. It was the only time I got to see Aunt Lizzie and her gang from High Spire, some eighty miles away. Even their names seemed different. There was a Willard and a Juanita, and a second cousin exotically named Kendra. One year there was even more excitement than usual. Uncle Elwood and Aunt Kay drove in from Michigan. I kept staring at my Midwestern cousins, Bruce, Janie, and Susie. They might as well have come from Mars. Alas for Aunt Margaret and Uncle Chet and their kids, Cindy, George, Joanne, and Patty, there was no magic of distance. They lived on Chain Street in Norristown, a mere block and a half from 802 George. I barely noticed them. As a once-a-year event, the reunion became a gauge by which to measure my progress, both physical and social. On the tennis court-sized yard, the uncles always got up a game of softball for the kids. I began as a tiny, grunting fumbler, swinging in vain at the slowest underhand tosses with as big a bat as I was. By the age of ten or eleven, I was clipping the grass with sharp grounders, then line drives to the garage. Then, as a seasoned teenager, shortstop, long flies into the strawberry patch beyond the trees. But by then, the family reunion was no longer number two on my calendar. It had been eclipsed by such happenings as school dances and miniature golf with my friends. The year came when I felt myself too big to participate in the softball game. In college, some years, I did not even attend the reunion. But home, home is a reunion daily, and I never felt too big for Christmas. Christmas was a Bible thing, of course, and a school vacation thing, and a wrap presents thing, and a homemade cookies thing. But most of all, as I look back, it was a family thing. My parents spent almost nothing on themselves. They bought only the clothes they needed. It was a big deal to treat themselves to a milkshake. They never went to movies, and yet, for all they gave my brother and me, you'd have thought they were rich. My Christmas gifts came in piles, from Lincoln Logs to the inevitable walnut in the toe of my red felt stocking. I accepted the presents strictly as the objects they appeared to be. Only years later did I realize the truth. The gifts was my parents' selfless love. One Christmas morning it bounced lightly off my chest as I came down the stairs and looked to see my first football wobbling at my feet. Another year it waited for me in the kitchen. I had unwrapped the last present from under the tree and my father said, Well, I guess that's it. Looks like you did pretty well this year. And then someone asked me to go to the kitchen for something. And there it was, in front of the sink, a spanking new cream and green white-walled, tired, roadmaster bicycle. Love leaning on a kickstand. Here's a picture of my mother and father at the beach in 1940, six months before I was born. That ends chapter 13. Please go back into the text to answer the questions before moving on.